developing enterprise and community distributions at the same time. Impossible? Please welcome her. So just to make sure the recording is working, my wood password is star, 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 star. Now everybody knows about it. Uh, okay, so my name is Frédéric Rosa. I'm working at uh, SUSE as uh, one of the SUSE Linux Enterprise uh, release manager. And today I will talk about to you about how we try to develop uh, our enterprise distribution alongside with uh, the community distribution uh, in OpenSUSE. And some people think it can't be done, and we are trying our best to make it possible. And we'll use, uh, I'll use uh, Tumbleweed, Leap, and Slee as an example. So first, um, just quick guess, how many people know the difference between Tumbleweed, Leap, and Slee? Okay. This quarter or third of the room. So that's good because I did a slide <coughs> just to make sure everybody knows what, what I will be talking about um, if you are not used to OpenSUSE. So I will use very often the, the term SLE, which is a SUSE Linux Enterprise. Uh, this is uh, our, the SUSE product, so uh, a set of products, so like SLES, the server product, SLED, the desktop product, and, and among others. So this is a, an enterprise distro, long-term support, etc., 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 which is developed by SUSE. Then uh, we have what we call OpenSUSE Factory, which is our development repository. So for people uh, used to uh, Fedora, this is equivalent of Rawhide, roughly. Um, and uh, uh, for Debian, I don't remember the name of the, re the, de the development repo, but yeah, you, you, you get the idea. Um, we have also now, on OpenSUSE, we have two distribution, not just one. Uh, we were a bit crazy, we thought, nah, why do just one distribution? Let's do two. We have what we call OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which was initially uh, created by uh, Greg Crow Hartman, and then um, the focus was changed a little bit, and that's uh, OpenSUSE rolling release, a bit like uh, Gen2, Arch, etc. Uh, except that it's based on OpenSUSE Factory or development uh, repo, but it has to be uh, fully tested and it has to pass our automated test uh, powered by OpenQA to be released. So on a good week you get one release every day. On, very, on a slow week you might get two releases per week. Uh, it depends, uh, and usually you get one kernel every week, or on heavy weeks you get a lot of, of kernel changes, etc. So this is a very fast rolling release. And on the other side, we have now what we call OpenSUSE Leap, which is um, our stable distribution, which is based on the SUSE Linux Enterprise code base, plus some parts which are coming from the from factory or uh, some specific repos, but most of the, of the things are coming from factory. So we have a mix of something very stable uh, as a base and something more fancy or more recent uh, on the top. So to, uh, I hope you can see the slides uh, because yeah, we've, there is a lot of, uh, lot of light, <coughs> but mostly, uh, you can see how we, we create uh, the various product. So we have OpenSUSE Tumbleweed on the top, which is, uh, thank Richard. <laughs> uh, we have OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which is always rolling. And we have our, uh, our SLE code base, um, SLE uh, 12 service pack 2, SP3, and then SLE 15. Uh, and then open, uh, Leap is based on top of the shared code. And when we do a new service pack on the enterprise level, uh, we usually uh, either we backport things from upstream or from Tumbleweed, or we just grab packages from Tumbleweed. Um, so this is the theory. Now let's talk about the reality. Uh, first, what we learned from 
or past. So I usually use the same example, so sorry for people who attended the Open Source conference um, previously. Um, so I'm going to use uh, the desktop uh, that we, we ship on, on SLI, which is GNOME. And for our major co last major code base, so SLI 12, which was done three to four years ago, something like that, um, we decided, oh, we'll take GNOME 3.10, which was at that time the, re the, re the release which was available upstream, more or less. And then we patched it. We fixed bugs, we added new features for our customers, etc., etc. The only thing is that we just kept our patches in our uh, SLI repo and we didn't push them on open or we try to push them upstream, of course, but we don't always push them to open source factory, so to our development uh, repo. And we always said, oh, yeah. We are in a hurry, we'll do that later. And then we release SLI 12, and then one year later we released SLI 12 SP1. But we, were, we had so many bugs to fix that, okay, yeah, we'll upstream later. And so basically nothing happened for SLI 12 SP1. So we, ha we had two code base, compl not completely, but really diverging. So the stable GNOME for the uh, enterprise customer and for people on OpenSUSE, something more recent, uh, directly from upstream, but losing some time fixes which were done for customers. So it was really not great. So we realized that, okay, we have to take action there. We really need to fix this mess because otherwise it will be unmaintainable uh, on the long term. Um, just as Reminder, the code base for a sleep product, we have to maintain it for 13 years. So you really want to make sure that you, don't, you have something which is sustainable. So what we say that, okay, for the next service pack, what we'll do is we want to think what, what our GNOME version in SLI and the one we have, we have in OpenSUSE. So we took the chance to update the version of GNOME from 3.10 to 3.20. And at the same time, we said, okay, can we make the source package exactly the same for both projects? And we did it. It was uh, 300 packages. Um, we, we had people discussing uh, between the SUSE desktop teams and the OpenSUSE desktop teams, which were completely s different people. Uh, the OpenSUSE desktop team, or the OpenSUSE GNOME team, uh, is known to be very picky at uh, documenting changes. Richard is part of it. <laughs> and now, these days, I'm also part of it. But uh, at that point in time, and it's still ongoing, you have to make sure your change log are really uh, Verbose, well written, so all the patches has to be properly documented with a bug number, etc. So it's really something that sometime in the sleep product on the desktop side, people were a bit sloppy. So they have to cope with the rule of the open source guy. Okay? Um, and we made sure to help the developers. The, um, the, that they could see how much they were diverging between the SLI product and the OpenSUSE um, packages. And so far, um, when there were changes which were really, oh, this seems to be just useful for enterprise customer. Uh, if we do that for, um, for the OpenSUSE people, it, they will be upset, etc. So let's add the patch, but we only build it for SLI. So we made sure that we were not breaking the open source side of the world. And we also discovered that sometimes uh, the open source people were suffering from bugs that we had fixed in sleep, but we forgot to enable the patch. So they had the patch, it was not just enabled. So, but we did it. The point was that we were able to um, work internally and then push to open source. 
we made sure that um, we had checks in, in place to make sure that packages, uh, this is a requirement for the sleep people, uh, we should always never lose a bug number in change logs or a feature number fate, as uh, Richard talked about, uh, in, the bug, in the change log or a CV number because we want to be sure that we never have a regression in the code base when we upgrade a package. And this is something that sometimes uh, uh, OpenSUSE project was not that concerned about. So this is something we, we kind of enforced. Uh, but um, the OpenSUSE people were very um, um, helpful in accepting that we injected uh, bug numbers uh, which were kind of fixed but the code never showed up in, uh, in the OpenSUSE code base because it was just fixed by upstream but we just had a way to tag that okay this bug it's, it has been fixed uh, in the code base and so far um, these days the bugs which are found on the lib package but where the lib package is coming from the SLE it's handled it's pushed to the SLE people so in short it means that um, um, Packages and users using packages which are inherited from SLE get basically the SLE quality or at least what we sell to customer, but they get, they get it in OpenSUSE. So best of both worlds. So this was the past. And now um, let's see what we have currently, what we are working on, which is SLE 15, our next uh, major release. Uh, and lib15, which is the equivalent uh, on the OpenSUSE side of things. So first, let me show you how we uh, we get things into our project, how we get changes in our, in our project. So how many people are familiar with the Open Build service or OBS? Oh, that's good. And not only OpenSUSE and SUSE people, that's even better. Um, so this is roughly what's happening when people want to do a change on the code base uh, either on SLE, so we have our own copy of the build service, we have an internal build service, uh, and or on factory, so on table with the open source side of things. So I use the term developer, you can replace that with a contributor if you prefer, um, but a volunteer, I'm fine with that. Um, so, developer is going to create what we call a submit request, basically a change, a patch with a change log, uh, a new version, a new table, whatever. Is uh, going to send that, so he's going to build that in his, in his own branch, and he's going to send that to a specific distribution. So it can be SLE 15, it can be factory, etc. Then this uh, change is going to be staged. Um, and a um, small subset of the distribution is going to be re generated. So basically we recreate the entire distro based on this change and we are going to test it with OpenQA. We are not going to run a full test suite but we just want to make sure that basically we can still install the distribution, uh, the desktop still uh, starts uh, and the icons are still in the proper place, etc, etc, etc. So this takes about 20 minutes to one hour these days. Um, and this, so, uh, the change is blocked at that point. Then at the same time uh, we have a review team which is going to check the change. So the review team can be uh, on the SLE side, it's usually a re release managers uh, and other people who are used to the, to the code. On the, open, on the OpenSUSE side, it's going to be also a release manager from OpenSUSE and very often in adv before that, there will be um, the people responsible for the set of packages, let's say the GNOME uh, OpenSUSE team. They are going to first review the change and say, yeah, it looks fine. So we have the four eyes uh, review principle in effect in, on both sides. And if the change is fine on, on the open uh, QA side, and if the reviewer say, yeah, looks okay, fine, then 
we accept the change. It's going to be integrated in the distro, which is going to be rebuilt. And then we are going to rerun the test suite, but this time we are going to run the test suite with all the tests. So you have an idea of how we integrate changes in, uh, in, in the distro. So we decided to, to put um, at, that, at that level here a lot of re automated reviews and a policy um, to make sure that we don't diverge or at least we don't diverge too much. I forgot, if you have questions, you don't have to wait until the end. Um, so we have what we call internally at SUSE, we have what we call the factory first policy now in place since um, it was already kind of in place since our previous service pack but now it's really fully in place um, uh, for, for our new code base. This states that the development of the distribution has to be done on factory. People should not do their change on our internal build service. They should do their, their development on the open build service and they have to push everything on the open uh, open source factory so basically on tumble with the rolling release which is good which can be released almost every day um, and then once it's merged in the open uh, open source factory we then take it back and push it in our SLE 15 code base um, so the idea is really to do the development in the open. There are always some caveats. Sometimes we have some uh, features which are developed uh, with uh, some partners which are under NDA until a, s uh, until a specific date, so we cannot release a code base until the NDA has ended, etc. But uh, for most of the things, that's what we do. Um, and to make things easier for developers, we said, okay, um, since we are asking you to do the development on Tumbleweed or Factory, it's the same, um, you don't have to even take care of SLE 15, at least for now. We have a bot which is going to look at all the changes which are accepted in the development distro it, it, and it's going to retrofit such those changes in the SLE code base. So it's really something like you don't have, you are working on an enterprise product, the next enterprise product, but in fact you are m working on the open source tumbleweed and we just generate the enterprise product based on that. So really um, this is to prevent forks or unwanted forks. Um, and yeah, because I'm not following exactly my slides. Uh, did I say everything I, I had? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so those, uh, those submissions from the, this bot, when something is accepted on, on factory and pushed back to, um, to SLE 15, they are still reviewed by uh, same, the same four eyes principles. They are still reviewed by the release manager on the SUSE side. And sometimes we find mistakes. Uh, uh, or we find something, oh, yeah, but this might fly on, on OpenSUSE, but it won't fly on SLE for that, 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 that reason. And then you have two solutions. First, either you say, ah, I'm going to fix that just for SLE. This is an easy way. Nah, no. Usually what we do is we reject the change for SLE and then we notify whoever did the change saying, okay, what you did, uh, it's not great, could you please fix it and make sure that you fix it on factory and then when it's accepted, we'll get the, new ch the proper change. Funny thing is often sometimes we detect things 
Even if it was reviewed by four different eyes in the factory, we detect issues at all, with our own four different eyes on Onsley, and then we just fix it. Um, and so far, it has been in place since uh, we have started to work on Onsley 15. Um, and it's still in place until this week. Um, so we are still in beta phase, but we had this uh, update crawler, what we call the update crawler bot, which is just crawling the factory uh, system and making sure that all the changes are pushed back to the sleep product. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that there are some... What, what are the main reasons for, for such occurrences? Like, uh, is that uh, something working for uh, open SUSE part but won't work for SA? So. Um, I, I'm repeating the question, so why something would work on OpenSUSE and would not work on SLEE? Yeah. And yeah. What are the main reasons? W the main reasons, um, I, I, I'll go there uh, a bit later, but um, a, an enterprise product is always much smaller than a, an open source version, usually. It, compare Fedora and Rail or uh, SLEE and, and OpenSUSE, so we focus on Mo less things, and sometimes a package might enable things like, oh, we want to build for 200 uh, uh, package, uh, language bindings, or that we don't ship on the SLE side, so we want to disable that, we don't want to have build requirements on that, or it can be that uh, they want to uh, support something which we don't ship on the, on the enterprise product, or sometimes there are a few cases where we are on purpose diverging from the open source side of uh, open source side of things, and then we have to say, yeah, but it won't work, so we have to handle this um, slightly different. But this is, I would say, a conscious decision. It's just not happening like that. So basically, the factory first policy is. Your submission won't pass unless it has good reason to pass. So we have, as I said, we have put a lot of um, bots in place to check all the submissions which are done. Um, we have a legal bot. What it's going to do is check the each submission and compare that with our uh, legal uh, database, which contains all the source code, uh, did an analysis on the source code and checked the license of each file, did a report and gave that to our uh, legal team who have said, yeah, looks okay, or mm, there is proprietary in the source code. I don't think that's good and they're going to reject it. So. But it's, there is a lot of automation to make sure that we don't end up uh, filling our lawyer uh, desk with that of, uh, no, it's not on paper, but you get the image of uh, reviews. Um, but it's still catching uh, a few things here and there. So that's, that's always good. Then we have um, what we call the maintenance bot. <laughs> it's trivial, but it just makes sure that the submission that has been sent already builds in the branch from the developer, because sometimes people send something and it doesn't even build for them. <laughs> it happens. It can be it not always their fault, it's just that they did something, uh, they sent a submit request, and then basically things change under their feet, and it doesn't build anymore, and <laughs> no. So we don't bother even reviewing the change because we, don't, we know it's going to break if we accept it. So. It's automatically rejected. Um, we have, I talked about that earlier, we have what we call the change of checker. So this is a requirement for SLE. Any change has to have um, a bug number or a feature number or a CV number. So uh, during the development phase, it's not really uh, enforced. But once we uh, enter the, really, uh, the RC phase, uh, or once we have uh, our product shipped, 
and we work on service pack, we want to make sure that each change is properly documented and we know why we are doing ch some changes, not just doing changes at, at random. Um, and then the last bot, which is the one that people complain a, a lot internally, is what we call the leaper bot. Um, this bot is going to check, is going to enforce that the factory first policy is properly uh, done or followed. So if the package has been directly submitted from the from factory, yeah, everything will be fine because it's, yeah, it's already upstream in our upstream, which is open source. So, okay. But um, sometimes people are in a hurry or they want to get a change uh, in the distro, in the SLE distribution very early before it's even accepted on the open source side of things. So there the bot is going to check is this submission uh, accepted on factory? If not, is it accepted in the development project on OpenSUSE? And if not, rejection. And that's when you start seeing people complaining. Because, yeah, but I did exactly the same change on both sides and it's, yeah, but you, change, you didn't really do the same change because you did the work twice at 10 minutes of interval and your change log entry is, has, doesn't have the same time step. So basically you put the burden on yourself because you did the work twice, you could have done it just once and it would have been accepted. So it's really, we are really trying to change the mindset uh, of people to contribute directly to our upstream which is OpenSUSE and at the same time reduce their own work. And if they don't do that, uh, the, pro the process is going to reject. Uh, and there are cases where we decide, okay, this package we accept to not follow any more uh, factory, so our development, we want to branch because this is still uh, an enterprise distribution and we at some point know that we are going to freeze the version of things or we are not going to take every last uh, changes or every new version of everything. So for instance, we have branch our kernel. We are based on kernel 4.12, it has been decided a long time ago. So the kernel is not going to be submitted from Tumbleweed to Slee, but every, the, the bot is still going to check if there is something which is a sa similar change which has been pushed to, um, to factory. So this is still good because the kernel is here and not a good example, but let's take uh, a package, I don't know, uh, Firefox uh, or whatever. Um, you want still when there is just a change to make sure that do we have the same change as it been pushed to factory or not. Sometimes it's not relevant because it's a backport from a new release which is already in factory, but sometimes it's really just a patch with a fix just for one thing and you just want to be sure that this patch has been pushed in both code base. Because if you don't do that, then the next time we rebase our distribution on, on factory, so for SLE 16, in three, four years, I don't know exactly, um, people will have to do the work again. They will have to push their change again to factory. Uh, as a, an example, when we did this entire process for SLE 15, we checked, we compared everything in, um, in the latest SLE 12 code base and, and factory, and we found some time patches which has been pushed since SLE 8 or SLE 9, so that's something like 10 years. So the guy, 14. 14, okay, so for 14 years, a guy was doing a change every major code stream release, so let's say every four years. Every four years, he was pushing the same change, the same patch, it's still applied 
on the enterprise code base, it never went to the open source side of things. So the guys were redoing the work every four years, for 14 years. So some people might say, yeah, that's a way to make sure you still have a job. <laughs> um, but if he would have done that in the first place, he would have saved a lot of effort. And, and because we're now enforcing this rule, we don't want these kind of ugly things to happen. So it was like, yeah, submission, factory first. We won't take it in Slee. You have to fix it, but factory first. And now it's in factory. So in four years, or three, three, four, five years, the job won't have to be done again and again and again. So yeah, this is a, a leaper bot. As I said, uh, and Richard already said it, because we had a lot of discussions that. If you want to do this kind of policy, use automation. Really. Because people will be frustrated by the policy, but they will be less frustrated if the rejection is coming from a bot rather than a human. We saw it. Actually, just in addition, make sure you give your bot a name that mentions bot. You make the mistake of naming some of our bots after your people. And Oh yes. So, so repeating, repeating the, the 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 comment from Richard. Make sure your bot name contains the name bot in it, because uh, yeah, we we tend to have um, uh, you know internal build service. Every account has to be binded at first to somebody, and basically the mail was sent by somebody, and people didn't realize it was not somebody. <laughs> rejecting it was a bot, which was just impersonating somebody. But really, really, um, it's helping a lot because people tend to be less frustrated when they get a rejection by a bot. They would say, yeah, pff, okay, I'll fix it. Uh, and then they compl comply to the rule. Especially, um, it's, it was really visible on the changelog checker. Rejecting when there was no changelog Entry, uh, not not a bug number entry, was really something we we were enforcing before manually, and people didn't. Yeah, f they would argue, argue. When it's a bot, it's reject. They submit one f one minute later, they get a mail that it has been rejected, and then one minute later, we get another submission fixing the damn thing. Mission accomplished. Yes, exactly. Mission accomplished. Um, of course, you will always get people uh, arguing, sometimes for good reason, but that's fine. Uh, when you reject something, don't just say reject. Make sure to say why you reject. Uh, or um, Leaperbot is making sure to give URLs to um, why it was it rejected, like um, the diff between um, the package which is submitted and the package which is on, on factory. So people can see that, <laughs> yeah, you have trailing spaces. <laughs> yeah, our bot is sometimes a bit dumb. It's not going to do semantic uh, difference between patch set. It's just going to do a plain diff. Uh, and then if something is slightly different, that a human would say, yeah, that's fine. No, the bot is going to be very dumb. Nah. If you can give enough information in the rejection, people will fix it themselves. They won't have to ask you, why was it rejected? And oh, very often we see that it's automatically rejected and then we get a submission five minutes later. Again, time saved for uh, all the people doing the reviews, all the infrastructure because we don't have to accept a submission which then is going to be fixed again and again, uh, and even for the developers, because uh, basically they, they are being taught that, yeah, you did something wrong, here is how you can fix it, and they are going to fix it themselves. Um, yeah, that's basically uh, that, and make sure that you can still override the bot. So, yeah, I will not say that we are, uh, the release manager are Jedi's, 
but sometimes we are we use our powers to make sure that things go through because this is still a bot and sometimes a bot is really wrong so we talked about um, the policies that we we are enforcing and um, how we are enforcing but you might wonder yeah but does it work is it give me numbers um, so first on sleet 12 um, so the old code base not all in the sense that it's released it's shipped but it's not a brand new that we are working on um, so we have the concept of service pack, so we layer things on top of other things. So we have a code base, a SLE 12 code base, which is uh, roughly 3,000 packages, 290, etc. Uh, then on top of that, one year later, we did service pack one, where we uh, only changed uh, 550 source packages. The rest was not even rebuilt. So the source is the same, the binary is the same unless there are something which is a uh, change in, in between, which me needs to be rebuilt. But And on top of that, we did service pack 2. Uh, we use some kind of TikTok uh, semantic for our service pack. So one service pack is, uh, the first service pack is stability fixes, not too much feature. The second service pack is, uh, oh, let's update the kernel and update the, the, the desktop and other things. And then again, a stability service pack. So one year we fix things, the other year you break things. Yeah, thank you Dodgy for, for saying what I was about to say, but it's best that is, I don't see, say that. Um, <laughs> so one year we, we stabilize things and one, one year we bring new feature. Let's put it in an enterprise nice way. Um, and on SLE 12 SP3, which was the first SLE distribution where we really enforced the factory first policy, um, uh, we had roughly 500 source packages, 300 were forks, like uh, we were diverging from uh, factory, but we made sure that those changes were still pushed uh, uh, on OpenSUSE. And still, we had 20% of packages which were directly imported from the uh, development distro, from factory, which saved a lot of time and effort for, for everybody. So this was, yeah, uh, SLE 12, we, this is a process we've put in the middle of the development. Now sw switching to SLE 15. We are currently at beta 6, which was released uh, on Friday. Uh, we have 3,300 uh, 3, uh, source packages, which is compared to SLE 15, yeah, about 10% more, but yeah, about the same number of packages. So on those 3,300 packages, Source packages, we have only, currently, I, when I did the, the, the extract on Friday, we have 7.4% of packages which are um, forks. So we have more than 92% of the distro which is already tumbleweed, which is factory. So our enterprise distribution is basically 95 90% open to the tumbleweed as a date of last Friday. Of course, so th when I say it's identical, it's identical at the uh, source at the source package level. So as, as SRPM are the same. What might be enable or not is uh, we decide to patch things in. Uh, we apply a patch which is only relevant for SLE or for OpenSUSE in some case, but that's more the exception than the rule. For reasons that we, we discussed earlier, we don't ship KD, for instance, on SLE, so uh, sometimes there are packages which are going to build things or require KD, uh, so we are going to disable that on SLE, etc. But that's, not, that's not, not bad. So this is about SLE. 
Let's switch. Yes, how, question. How are your salespeople happy about saying that 92% of the enterprise distribution is the same as the public one? So how our salespeople are going to sell the fact that uh, our enterprise distro is basically the open system we do distro. So first, they, d they don't yet know it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to make sure that they won't know about it. Um, no, uh, more seriously, uh, we, we still are going to... Um, Tumbleweed is a rolling distro. So in one month, it will be farther away from uh, Sleep 15. So we are, it's going to drift. And, um, but we will make sure that uh, our SLI code base has to be st rock stable, etc. Insert all the, uh, the thing about that. Uh, and yeah, we, at this moment in time, yes, we are now at 90%. We will go uh, lower on that. I have two, two questions in the back. Yeah, I was wondering uh, when you start freezing uh, packages, you will uh, have a situation where things will differ. Shouldn't you have then a leap second policy? Where you say, okay, if we do backport fixes, so the question was, yeah, you are going to freeze the version. So what about uh, the backports? The, all the fixes are you going to do in SLI? Uh, what do you do? Do you push them uh, to OpenSUSE? So yes, this part of the policy or factory first policy mentions that uh, people should still submit their change to uh, the OpenSUSE side of things. Um, if it's a backport, often you don't have to do it because uh, it, the version will be just up updated in you know, Tumbleweed and that's it. Um, it's, it if it's uh, just a patch, it has to be pushed. So we are still making sure that all changes, our stabilization effort benefit to, uh, to OpenSUSE. Just, just for the sake of in three, four years when we rebase our enterprise product, we just want to have those fixes already in. We just want, don't want to redo the work again and again and again. Dodgy, you had a question? No? That's good? Okay. Um, yep. So I talked about SLI. Uh, let's talk about LEAP. So LEAP, um, as a reminder, is the distribution which is using the core of the SLI source package. And then on top of that, a lot of more packages which are not shipped on SLI or that the open source community thinks we want something more recent than uh, which is on, on SLI. Um, so, so it's very small, so I'm, but uh, I have uh, some graphs after which are a bit uh, more readable. But roughly <coughs> for the la latest uh, LIP release, so 42.3, uh, we had 10 thousand source packages compared to 300, uh, 3,000 uh, source packages in, in, in SLI. Um, from those uh, 10,000, 2,000 2, roughly were coming from SLI, so 20%. So open to the leap is 20% SLI, all the rest is either coming from factory, 22%, and the rest is. Did I got? Majority is just 42. Yeah, um, yeah, because we use the same concept of. Uh, I should have uh, put my slides in. Um, the order should be the in the other order. 42.1, then 42.2, then 42.3. We use the same concept of service pack. So 42.3 is done on top of 42.2, which is done on top of 42.1. So the changes which are only in 42.3, they are coming from. 20% SLI, 22% um, factory, a few things which are specific to this version, so a KDE 5 LTS release that the KDE people did uh, nicely for, they made sure that their release uh, schedule was a bit following the, the, the open to the leap uh, schedule, which was very nice from, from them. Uh, and then we inherit uh, basically half of the packages from the previous uh, release and then again and again. You have to think, uh, remember that OpenSUSE Leap is uh, thought as a uh, stable open, open source distro. So um, 
long-term support or whatever you want to call it. Um, for people who want something which is going very fast, we have another answer, which is called open source Tumbleweed. And we have lib15, lib15, which is in beta, yep, thanks, uh, which is in beta for about two, one or two weeks. Um, it's following, it's based on sli15. Uh, it has roughly the same number of packages than lib42.3, so 10,000 packages, source packages. Um, on those, you have 27% coming from SLI 15. So SLI 15, remember, 3,300 pa source packages, and from that, we are able to reuse in, in LIP 2,800 packages. Not bad. I should have done the math of how many percent of the SLI 15 entire code base is in LIP, but that's that's not bad. And the rest is coming directly from factory. And we have, yeah, a, bit, a few bits from, uh, uh, from the devil project. So if you put that in a nice uh, graph, you see that when we did the first leap release, 42.1, there was a bit, a bit chunk which was coming from SLI, and all the rest were coming from factory. And then, over time, we reuse the packages from, uh, so the percentage of packages used from SLI increased, which is good because it means that, uh, what I forgot to say, that OpenSUSE Leap, being based on SLI packages, packages which are coming from SLI are maintained by the SUSE people. So when there are bug fixes, they have to be done by the SUSE people. So the community at large benefit from the work that uh, the SUSE uh, employee are doing and fixes which are done for uh, a paying customer on SLI, they end up once the maintenance update is released to the SLI people, uh, a while after I think it's a few weeks or things like that, it's going to end up automatically in LIP. So leap benefit from the fixes that people are paying SUSE to fix on SLI. So the more packages are, which are coming from SLI in open system algorithm means the less pressure work the community has to take care of directly. Uh, they benefit from um, paying customer, basically. So that's nice. Um, and yeah, leap 15, as you see, um, yeah, 30, about 30% from LIP, yeah, a bit less, and the rest is from factory. That's nice. And with that, just to make sure that uh, we are always improving, as Richard mentioned, we are agile. So we, we learn over time uh, things which works, which, things which doesn't work, and we are trying to improve, smooth our process, uh, we have a lot of discussion internally, but I'm really uh, hoping that you have also questions, suggestions, so I'm open to that. Yes, yes. Um, so you said you're using OpenQA to test uh, data that goes through. I'm referring to the diagram that you used earlier. Uh, so you have a small OpenQA that runs a few tests, and then you have a large OpenQA that runs all the tests at the, at the end of the controls, basically. Yep. Uh, for the first one, does it mean that if we, I mean, for OpenQA works with screenshots, is that right? So, um, uh, I'm repeating the question for the recording. Um, so we have OpenQA, which is testing first when there is a new t a change, a small subset of all the entire test suite, and then uh, once uh, the change is accepted, the entire test suite, OpenQA is based uh, on a screenshot, but it yeah. And serial, and and the thing is that once you have a distro, distro which is installed by OpenQA, you can run anything in it, and you can do run your a different test suite inside, and just check the results uh, in OpenQA. So that either is the result of the test suite internally is going to be pushed to the serial console, or just display OK, and then the screenshot tool with which is OK 
appearing or not. Uh, but you didn't finish your question. Uh, are you the architecture from the community that work on uh, factory and on the read providing the, the open issue based format? So the so question was, um, since we are heavily uh, OpenQA based, um, our packager from the community contributing to OpenQA, so yes. Um, and even more than that, uh, we are making sure that our test suite between the SLEE product and the OpenSUSE product are uh, shared as much as possible. Uh, I don't think we are at 100%, uh, but... It's all in the same GitHub. Yeah, so it's all on GitHub. Other questions, remark? No, okay, so thanks. And uh, if this kind of, this is a kind of challenge you are interested in, uh, Sue has a lot of job opening, so. <laughs> <laughs>